My name is Billy Pickett. I work at TechSoup. I run an initiative called Maker Labs at TechSoup. And Public Good App House here is our initiative focused on uh, drawing more direct connections between makers of public goods and those implementers in civil society. So we have a great interest in this conversation because we really want to um, unlock the potential of more purpose-built tools in civil society. And we want those makers of those tools to be in closer conversation with funders like yourself, Susie, and implementers like people like Eli and I um, working at nonprofits. So that's our intent and interest uh, here. And of course, the equity issue uh, in uh, the maker spaces you uh, identified is very close to our hearts and uh, being as, a, as an organization. Uh, TechSoup has a, our own uh, DEI uh, initiative, and we are really struggling, to be perfectly frank, with enrolling more diversity in the maker spaces that we're, we're running. So um, the, that, that piece of this research is, is really um, important to us. So thank you for that. Sure. I'm happy to jump in. Well, I'm Susie Lee uh, with the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, and I live and work in San Francisco, uh, but our foundation is headquartered in Michigan. And I am on our impact investing team, so mission-driven investing. We sit in between the endowments investing of our full um, uh, assets under management and our programmatic work. Uh, so uh, I lead our program-related investing work. And um, so my primary focus is on investing. However, we do have um, small grant budgets out of our team to do um, ecosystem building and research. And so that is the context in which we supported uh, CCI and this work. But our focus is on racial equity, racial equity in the capital markets, closing the racial wealth gap. And so all of the, um, what we'll be talking about here is incredibly uh, important um, to our, our overall um, focus on, on impact and um, equitable opportunity. My name is Renee Pinto de Silva Barton. I'm the head of impact research at Crypto Council for Innovation, uh, which is a global alliance seeking to advance innovation and inclusion in Web3. Um, you know, one of our core values is to unlock the promise of Web3 through actionable and evidence-based insights. And so in support of that, our research program is, is very important. Uh, where I had original research, uh, documenting the real-world impacts uh, of the Web3 space, including, uh, very importantly, equity and inclusion in the space. So we're really happy to have partnered with WKKF on, on this research. We think it's an important conversation that sadly has not been present enough in, in Web3. So today we're uh, diving into a subject that sits at the intersection of emerging tech and social equity. We're here to explore the findings of the recently published Building a More Equitable Web3 report by the team at the Crypto Council for Innovation. With us are Renee Barton, the researcher behind this important work, and Susie Lee, the program officer from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, who's supporting the work. Before we dive into the depths of the report here and its implications, I'd like to give um, our audience a sense of who you are and the perspectives you bring to this important uh, intersection of tech and social equity. Rather than offering a standard bio, I'm, I'm interested in hearing how you would introduce yourselves in the context of this discussion. What aspects of your background experiences or intellectual journey do you feel are most relevant to our conversation today? And as you share, I'd be particularly interested in hearing about any pivotal moments or insights that shaped your understanding of Web3's potential impact on society and equity. Renee, as the researcher behind the report, perhaps you could start us off. So I, I will say that I came to Web3 with more than a healthy dose of skepticism. Um, I had worked for several years in the digital equity space, advising uh, government entities on uh, innovation strategies, technology workforce development plans, uh, smart city deployment plans, uh, technology governance strategies, and the like. Um, and I had this understanding of crypto, as many, I think, still do today, as being the space dominated by libertarian bros, um, quite frankly. And, um, you know, at a certain point, my brother-in-law gifted me my first cryptocurrencies. Um, I, be I believe it was a Ripple coin. And I had to go and set up 
uh, my first wallet. And um, I sort of went down the rabbit hole, as they say, um, and I really began to understand some of the other use cases for for crypto, for blockchain, and um, became very interested in my resistance to understanding some of those things when there was this incredible amount of activity that was happening in the space. Um, and this very high level of adoption of crypto within communities that I was surprised to see, um, particularly really high rates of adoption in Black communities and in Latino communities in the U.S. Um, and that was sort of the, the germ of my interest in this space and uh, sort of my pathway into doing research in the Web3 space. Um, so that that's sort of the perspective I bring here. Um, if you're uncomfortable with something, engage with it because you might just learn some really interesting things about how people are using technology. Thank you, Renee. That provides excellent context for your work. I appreciate the background. Uh, now, Susie, as a representative of the WK Kellogg Foundation, I'm curious about your perspective. How would you introduce yourself and your role in this conversation? Sure. I am an investor um, at heart, and I've been, you know, started my career in, you know, traditional investing, actually in private equity and then in venture. And throughout my career, I've been, you know, focused on innovation. So both being an investor, a venture investor directly in innovation, really curious about how various innovation and technology can transform systems, transform industries. Um, and frankly, my journey into impact investing from Conventional vesting really came about because I saw a lot of the flaws and the challenges with the conventional system in terms of essentially all of the value that is derived from investments, let's say in the private equity asset class, essentially go back towards those who have capital and it is extracted from others in the value chain who are creating that value, whether it be employees, customers, partners, suppliers. Um, and so I've been, you know, spending many years really thinking about what are ways to innovate um, in the capital markets to create a more equitable um, capital market, more equitable access and opportunity. And um, that led me um, in Kurtz to the Kellogg Foundation, where we're focused on equitable opportunity, we're focused on racial equity, um, and the mission-driven investing work is really focused on transforming the capital markets, again, to close the racial wealth gap, to um, make the capital markets more equitable. And where Web3 um, and crypto come into all of this is really it is a new innovation, a new technology platform that does have that potential to uh, transform access and um, and really unlock equitable opportunities for communities who have historically been excluded from the financial marketplace and from economic opportunity. And so that's the lens that I uh, bring to this. And again, primarily my role is on the investment side. And yet we do, as a foundation, uh, we're in the grant making business. And so our team has, you know, a, a small grant making budget to support ecosystem innovation. And, um, and so that's what brought us to uh, support this um, critical work that uh, the Crypto Council for Innovation is doing. Renee, I want to start with you, um, and I want to hear a little bit about background and vision for uh, the report. I'd like to start with the question about um, your motivations or CCI's motivation behind writing uh, the report itself. A lot of our work is really focused on informing policy discussions around responsible use of technology um, and, uh, you know, supportive policy that can really foster innovation. And we came to this report with an understanding that all too often the voices of many who stand to be the most impacted by policy are not included in conversations. Um, and so that was really sort of the grounding motivation for, for this research. Um, we also were coming to this research with an understanding that we're at a really pivotal moment in Web3. Um, which, you know, for any of our listeners who are not familiar, I, I sort of use as a term to refer broadly to the ecosystem that has emerged around blockchain-based technology. So everyone building in the space, uh, the people using the tools, those investing. Um, we really came to this research with an understanding that we're at this pivotal inflection point for the technology, right? Um, there's been a, quite a lot of volatility over the past few years, market uh, downturns, um, followed now by this 
a you know seeming era of maturity. Major ETFs have been approved. Uh, we see legacy financial institutions moving into the space, um, you know, somewhat giving their stamp of approval um, to, to the sector. Um, and and sort of yet, despite all of this um, seeming maturity, this is a space that still feels very opaque to many that are outside of it, um, including investors, including policymakers who are being charged with with regulating the space, um, and and even many users who may be deterred from adopting some of these new use cases that could be really impactful uh, for them. Um, and you know, at the same time as all of this is going on. Uh, one of the rallying cries for, for Web3 has been that it is a democratizing force for digital spaces, um, that it will increase access to opportunity for all. Um, and so at this sort of inflection point in maturity, it felt like a very important moment um, to examine the extent to which this promise has actually been realized in the space. Uh, we began the research with a focus on builders specifically, um, because we feel that often the composition of who is building within a particular industry is really indicative of what is being built and who it is being built for. And so by documenting the experiences of underrepresented builders, um, and specifically for this work, the experiences of Black and Latino builders in the U.S., uh, we sought to really contextualize how some of these new technologies are actually providing new access points today for opportunities that then can have important ripple effects um, for equity and for access in communities across the U.S. Susie, from the foundation's perspective, why was it important to fund this particular research and how does uh, it align with uh, Kellogg's mission? So maybe I'll start with our, our mission writ large is, um, is to uh, serve children and ensure that all children are thriving and that requires, you know, children live in families, families are part of communities. And so our areas of work are um, across uh, employment equity, uh, access to healthy food and food systems transformation, uh, early childhood education, health equity, um, and and again, this um, access to capital uh, is 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 core to to all of that. And so um, I would say that this impacts all of our um, programmatic work, but on the investment side, again, as I as I mentioned, we are really focused on um, innovating in the capital markets and ensuring that the capital markets are uh, more equitable. Maybe I'll share some, I think, some framing uh, points just around inequality um, to explain and connect um, why this work in particular is important to us. I mean, the the um, the racial wealth gap, uh, the median um, net worth of white households in the U.S. is around $180,000, which is nearly 10 times uh, the wealth of black households in the U.S., uh, which is which averages around $18,000. And that's four and a half times um, uh, the wealth of um, Latinx households, um, which is around $40,000. And so that's a huge, that racial wealth gap um, is enormous in the United States. And access to financial services, access to um, the financial system, access to capital is key to driving, um, to reducing that um, racial uh, wealth gap. Uh, similar on um, the gender uh, wealth gap as well. Um, access to capital um, for uh, Black-led um, and uh, Latinx-led businesses is, uh, there's a huge disparity in access, both on the lending side and on the venture side. When we talk about the builders um, that this report features, um, you know, we look at the venture um, landscape, a lot of our, we, we um, our mission-driven investing is largely focused. It's a private market strategy on the, we carve outside from the endowment. And um, we also um, are able to make venture uh, capital investments out of our philanthropic pool as well. But from a venture funding perspective, the funds that are investing in these innovators, um, you know, only one and a half percent of all venture capital goes to black and Latinx founders. And for women, so for women of color, um, the numbers are even more stark um, with less than one-tenth of one percent of venture funding going to Black and Latinx women funders. Um, and so when we look at the statistics and then we look at um, the builders in Web3, um, the landscape that we are seeing uh, in just 
venture funding overall, which funds general technology and innovation, that carries over. Um, and uh, Web3 as an emerging technology, these builders are facing similar um, challenges in accessing capital. So it's really important to us um, to highlight the work um, of these builders, highlight uh, the gaps that exist in the ecosystem, and really um, uh, shine a light on what uh, where funders need to be focused in terms of um, allocating capital um, and where the opportunities are. I mean, where where there are underfunded opportunities, there's opportunity for alpha and um, also opportunities to solve um, enormous uh, problems across uh, sectors, whether that be access to health or access to financial services. And so um, that's sort of the broader reason why this work is really important and um, the research that Renee and CCI did to um, uncover a lot of these insights and um, uh, not only shine a light on sort of the, the state of the industry, but also really interview um, entrepreneurs and builders themselves to understand what that experience um, is like and, uh, and how what's needed in the ecosystem to ensure that these builders will have the resources and the access to capital to succeed. Let's dive into the meat of the report. Renee, I, I want to start um, with you uh, and talk about the state of uh, Web3. The report, it, it's a robust report that paints a robust picture. It's quite rich and robust, and it paints a robust picture of the the ecosystem. Could you tease out the some of the key findings and insights uh, from the report and walk us through what you see as the, what was the most surprising or counterintuitive findings from, from your research? Yeah, so in terms of uh, teasers from findings from the report, our, our first big key finding was that underrepresented builders are really at the forefront of Web3 innovation in the U.S., uh, but at the same time, uh, continue to face access challenges that are comparable to other legacy tech and innovation spaces. Um, and so when we really dug into uh, some of the findings, um, you know, what we see when you look at data for raises over $1 million um, by sub-industry uh, within Web3, we're really seeing that the biggest Web3 projects led by diverse founders are concentrated in areas that are just experiencing explosive growth at the moment. So, um, you know, projects concentrated in fintech and software, which generally aligns with this broader move to financial normalization in Web3 and the growth of AI um, and associated needs like file storage and, and computing. Um, what is really interesting though, is when you dig into this data, um, you really see examples of Black and Latino founders addressing market segments that tend to be overlooked by investors despite being really big opportunity areas. Um, some of that alpha that Susie was, was just sort of referring to. Um, you know, examples such as payment solutions for immigrant communities, um, file storage that lowers costs for small businesses, um, healthcare data solutions that are sensitive to low income communities, um, and the like. And uh, really, this affirms a lot of the longstanding research that diversity is great for innovation and great for ROI. Um, and, you know, we spoke with over 60 builders uh, to, to create this report. We attended um, eight conferences and events across the U.S. We were continuously moderating uh, uh, or surveying online digital spaces to sort of get a sense of what people were talking about. And in the course of this research, nearly every builder we spoke with told us that they were building for the unmet needs they could see within their communities um, and needs that were typically outside of what is funded uh, by, by investors. Um, and so, you know, having said that, Web3 is not um, immune to some of the shortcomings of, of other innovation spaces. And we really see this um, manifested in fundraising in the Web3 space. Um, you know, often for Black and Latino founders, the biggest barrier to success is access to capital, um, as well as access to social networks, which often provide the grooves through which capital um, can flow. Um, and so uh, just sort of looking at the data on this slide here, um, according to Crunchbase data that, that we analyzed, um, you can really see that since 2017, Black and Latino founders have really just raised a fraction of overall funding uh, that has been allocated to the Web3 space. Um, you know, for Black founders, we see that, 
you know, funding has never really exceeded uh, 1% of total Web3 uh, funding since 2017. And, um, you know, we can see that in 2017, there was sort of a standout year for Latino founders. Um, the data was sort of skewed by a, a couple of really large deals. Um, uh, but overall, we see similarly uh, low shares of overall funding uh, for diverse founders, uh, for Latino founders in, in Web3. Um, and so, you know, some of that strength I just mentioned for more diverse founders where they're seeing under-recognized market segments is, is also really a challenge at times. It can be challenging for many VCs to sort of appreciate market opportunities that they have not personally experienced or that they have not been, um, you know, seen historically borne out, uh, which is just sort of a, a reinforcing uh, loop in many ways. Um, you know, investors like to fund what they know, and this is just often realized in funding uh, founders that share characteristics with them. Um, you know, having having said all of that, um, I think some of these trends are also magnified by the volatility that we've seen and by some of the regulatory uncertainty that we've seen um, in this space. You know, when there are market downturns or um, you know, as others uncertain uncertainties, diverse founders are often really the first to lose out. Um, and so, you know, in the context of, of equity and inclusion in Web3 overall, um, you know, it, we're really sort of at a critical moment where we can address some of these shortcomings and ensure that we're not repeating some of these cycles from past uh, innovation uh, industries where, you know, we've seen the outcomes. Uh, you know, products that don't really address the needs of many underserved communities, um, a landscape where there is not a lot of diversity in terms of the leadership of the companies that that rise to the top. Um, CZ, I don't know if you wanted to add anything there on, on the investor perspective. I would say that this this just mirrors what we see in an, uh, just innovation and tech investing in general, right? And it's a micro, it's a uh, it is um, perhaps even more dire. Uh, some of those numbers, especially. Um, but I think if you look at the full funding ecosystem of, again, it's venture capital funders are the ones generally funding these early stage tech innovators in Web3, who's funding the venture funds? It is institutional limited partners. And if we look at the, the data and just, you know, again, the, the uh, status quo that we are trying to move, to, uh, move the needle on and change, you know, of of the roughly, you know, over 70 trillion in assets under management in the U.S., only 1.3% of that is managed by diverse owned firms. And the rest of that is basically <laughs> managed by a homogenous group of largely white men. Um, of, and when you talk about, um, you know, investors investing in um, what they know, who they know, uh, that trickle down effect of institutions supporting venture funds that are again largely um, male led, white led, um, and I mentioned the venture statistics. Um, there are very few venture funds that then are led by um, people of color, women, um, who can then find, connect with, and invest in um, entrepreneurs and these Web three builders of color, and so. What we are um, trying to do um, in our overall strategy is really ad identify venture fund managers who are um, seeing opportunity across sectors um, of supporting diverse founders um, and innovators. We, we have you know, a thesis just around proximity. Um, those who, you know, I think one of the, the, the most um, compelling uh, findings in this report is that as you said, stated, the majority, I think it was 92% or so of the builders you interviewed are building solutions for the communities that they know that they're from. And um, that has a lot of value. Um, that is, um, you know, we see that across sectors, across um, industries, across impact areas where entrepreneurs and innovators that really understand a community, understand the challenges are able to innovate and build solutions that work. Um, because they're close to they're close to the market, they're close to the um, the customers, and they're close to the issues. And so, again, for us, um, 
closing that cap that capital gap. Um, that's that slide that you showed is so compelling, but also so depressing <laughs> when you actually look at. Um, I think there are ways that it could actually look a lot worse. When I looked at, it, I was like, oh, that doesn't look. Good. But it's actually quite um, horrific in terms of the lack of flow of capital to um, these uh, these innovators and, and entrepreneurs. And so um, again, we're we, we've got. Um, you know, a handful, well, the majority of our um, venture uh, capital portfolio um, of, again, fund managers are, we are focused on diverse um, led and owned um, fund managers who are then investing in um, entrepreneurs of color, women entrepreneurs. And I think that thesis, when applied um, to the innovation and that the Web3 marketplace, uh, holds where the more fund managers we can identify who are, uh, again, looking for those um, overlooked opportunities, uh, which can produce outsized returns, um, we need to really start, uh, it has to start at the institutional level to flow more capital to uh, venture funds that are um, open and actively um, seeking to um, support uh, more diverse entrepreneurs, and then the capital can flow uh, from those venture funds into these uh, innovators. But the change has to happen sort of at all levels of the of the capital markets uh, ecosystem. And so I think the findings of this report really bring that to light in terms of you know the challenges in Web three are, are really not dissimilar um, to those challenges in um, broader tech and in the broader venture capital um, marketplace. But I think what's unique is that there are more, um, again, the, the the percentage of builders who are um, uh, underrepresented or from diverse backgrounds uh, appears to be sort of at a higher um, rate than in other areas. Um, and some of the, the fundamental um, components of this technology um, lend itself to, um, again, a, a more rapid um, ability to, to close some of these gaps. So on that on that very note about the uniqueness of Web three, you know, philanthropy often acts as a bridge uh, between sectors of society. And uh, my question is 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 about how how you see the role of uh, philanthropic organizations responding to this moment uh, across the the field at the field level from a, a philanthropic uh, perspective. Are you seeing new opportunities or unique opportunities? emerging in the space that other foundations should be looking at or um, are looking at and and sort of starting to organize around? I love that question. <laughs> and it does lead into a lot of the work we're aiming to, 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 to achieve, which is bringing other funders um, on board. Um, I think even within, uh, I mean, the Kellogg Foundation, we're, we're a large national foundation um, and I would say when I talk about this work internally, let me say, um, in terms of general tech innovation, AI as an example, I would say nine out of 10 colleagues would like understand what AI is and understand like its implications, both in terms of their daily work and in terms of how it applies to a program area. When I talk about Web3 or crypto or this, you know, I'd say maybe one or two out of 10 people actually understand like what it is and what the potential is. And so part of, I think step one is really um, uh, making this content and, and um, for example, the things we're talking about here, really um, educate others and kind of bring folks along in terms of the applicability of this technology to, um, again, all the program areas that we focus on. Uh, you know, how is Web3 uh, a lever for change in health equity? How is it, you know, and I think that is, we're just beginning those conversations to really bridge that um, knowledge gap. And I think once people see it and they see the case studies and they can understand how it's applicable to their strategies and their portfolios, then I think we're unlocking a lot of um, potential you know, resources and support of integrating Web3 and these opportunities into a broader, uh, broader strategies around systems change in these areas. Um, and that's you know within our own foundation, um, and then again, at peer foundations um, and in philanthropy in general, I think when we look at the broader uh, marketplace, I think we've seen misperceptions around crypto, certainly 
you know, with all with FTX collapse, all these, you know, people hear crypto and they think, oh, that's like the bad thing with all these, you know, <laughs> bad actors and we're going to avoid it. Or even on our endowment investment side, you know, they are looking for um, outsides returns um, on the venture side. But um, sometimes I get a sense that, um, you know, crypto it's, it's about exposure and it's like, oh, our exposure is, you know, and it's about risk mitigation rather than seeking um, the positive opportunities. And so I think philanthropy has a, uh, we're at the beginning of this journey, but when I talk to a lot of peer funders, I mean, I get these blank stares like, what are you, what are you talking about? Or I went to, I went to a, um, a major um, uh, Web3 conference, Big Tent, you know, for, and I explained like what I do. I was like, oh, I do impact investing for this foundation. And they're like, oh, well, why are you here? And I had to kind of do the rationale of really, you know, explaining what, um, how we opened this conversation around really the opportunity um, to uh, unlock uh, access um, to a more equitable capital market. And um, I think, uh, I think it's bridging these knowledge gaps and really uh, telling story, which I think this report helps do, right? We, this report and all of the great research that CCI um, and Renee is leading um, can help tell those stories. And, um, and really make this relevant um, to uh, leaders of a particular um, issue area in philanthropy that are doing grant making. And then from our team side, I mean, again, as I mentioned, we work along the full capital spectrum. So um, grant making is the you know, largest body of work at the foundation writ large. Our team does investing, but we invest out of multiple pools of capital. So we can invest philanthropic dollars, um, as um, equity or debt investments, and those are program-related investments. They're catalytic, they're flexible, um, they can take on a lot more risk. And then we have a carve out from the endowment where we make market rate investments, but again, are um, aiming to innovate and, and um, invest in uh, opportunities that are values aligned and mission aligned. Um, and so we can, and I think it's important to, to not only activate philanthropy on the grant side, but again, activate all of the um, institutions that are doing impact investing and can pull um, from various pools of capital with various uh, risk appetites because there is opportunity all along the spectrum. And when you mentioned collaboration, you know, there's various forms of capital is required to support all of these areas of innovation in the ecosystem. And so we've started with, again, grants to um, CCI for this research, but we're, we're also looking at what are the opportunities along the capital spectrum for us to continue to support and advance work um, in this area in support of the foundation's broader uh, mission, which is in service to, to children. Renee, what are the, let's talk about challenges and opportunities for um, underrepresented uh, builders in Web3 today. What did the research find around uh, the biggest challenges and opportunities uh, for the Black and Latino builders? I know I sort of painted a stark picture with the the state of equity and inclusion in Web3, um, you know, particularly around there being a lot of the same challenges for um, for Black and Latino builders in this space as in, as in other spaces. Um, it, it turns out that there are um, additional new challenges and, and opportunities for these builders in, in Web3 as well. Um, and so, you know, sort of beginning with with some of the challenges that we found, um, what's new in Web3 is just the immense burden of um, a lack of regulatory clarity in, in the space. Um, you know, as, as many listeners to, to this might understand, uh, we're sort of in a very uh, tenuous place in the U.S. in, in terms of crypto policy and, and policy around digital assets. Um, and so, uh, you know, where this really matters um, is in the outside burdens that this can create for builders who've historically already been uh, underinvested and may lack some of the access to capital and other resources that are sort of required to to navigate, um, you know, some of those additional burdens required with uh, required of, of, you know, compliance and um, just navigating a fraught landscape. Um, and so really the, the key additional challenges that we see for Black and Latino builders in Web3 associated with this lack of regulatory clarity are higher operational costs, 
uh, decreases in competition and dynamism and a pressure to offshore. Um, and, you know, I want to be very clear, uh, builders in, in every space um, are tasked with complying with, with laws and, and regulations. But I think where there's sort of this lack of clarity, those challenges are compounded uh, for builders who, again, have traditionally lacked access to the capital and other resources to, to sort of navigate them. So specifically in Web3, um, we're seeing higher operational costs um, for, for builders um, that are associated with an inconsistent or fragmented regulatory environment. So this requires builders to engage more legal support, push out timelines. Um, many of the builders that we spoke with are pivoting frequently within their projects. So they might have a really great idea um, to serve their community, but they may not deploy it because they're uh, fearful of some sort of reprisal, that sort of thing. Um, we're seeing these higher operational costs translate into decreases in competition and dynamism. So some of these elevated costs and challenging market conditions um, have really contributed to consolidation we're already seeing in the Web3 industry among some of the most well-resourced companies, um, which typically tend to be led by, by white men. Um, and, you know, this really squeezes out some would-be competitors, including, you know, smaller businesses who, you know, may simply lack the resources um, to compete. And in, all of this is contributing to a pressure to offshore. So we're seeing um, many founders and investors looking abroad um, to jurisdictions with more clearly defined regulatory regimes to sort of reduce risk and increase operational clarity. And um, a large share of the builders that we spoke with noted that they had heard this from investors. And really the only companies um, that can afford to, to you know, move abroad in an environment like this are those that are very well capitalized. Um, you know, what are the implications for all of this um, for equity and inclusion? You know, when when companies move ashore, um, some of the market the markets that they're seeking to serve may change. And so in the long term, um, there's a real concern that, you know, some of the communities that are being overlooked in the U.S. may not continue to be served um, by new products and services that are emerging in, in the Web3 space. So with, with all of that being said um, about some of the challenges that we're seeing in the space, um, we're also seeing that there are a number of, of new opportunities for builders as well. Um, and we're really seeing that some of the core qualities of Web3 are helping to empower all builders in Web3, uh, including, you know, very specifically diverse founders who've been historically um, underinvested. Where we're really seeing some of these unique and novel Web3 strengths are in three key areas. Um, so we're really seeing that the technology and the efficiencies afforded by the technology can help to lower costs for builders, uh, which in turn lowers barriers to entry. Um, and the fact that blockchain uh, is based on open source technologies is really further lowering technological barriers to building. Um, many of the, the builders that we spoke with cited that fact, right? Um, you might not need a million dollars to start up because you're not programming everything from scratch. You're entering an ecosystem um, where, uh, you know, there, there is a, a big body of work and other partners that you can engage with. Um, and then some of these efficiencies afforded by blockchain technology, um, you know, instant transaction settlement, um, some disintermediation. Um, this also in turn allows some business models to pencil that may not have been in previous technological regimes. So, um, you know, one example um, are, are payments, right? So um, if you look at cross-border payments or remittances that many immigrant communities in, in the U.S. send abroad, they're really high cost. And so some of the efficiencies that are afforded um, by blockchain are allowing new business models to emerge that offer, you know, far lower cost products to these communities, which is fantastic. Um, sort of the most germane to the conversation we've been having to date um, around capital and sort of this lack of capital for Black and Latino builders are novel vehicles for organizing capital that are emerging um, within Web3. So Web3 tooling is really allowing um, for the formation of new vehicles for communities to sort of self-organize and invest in founders. So um, for example, allowing for the formation of, of something called investment DAOs. 
So these are decentralized autonomous organizations that sort of use uh, blockchain technology to automate voting um, and the allocation of funds once, once members put them into the group. Um, and that's providing this really great infrastructure for, for what are being called social investment clubs. Um, and, and the fact that communities can then organize um, their own capital, you know, smaller dollar amounts towards founders that are within their community, this is really a, an important new way of providing critical early and more democratic support for Web3 projects that they, they may not have been able to get from traditional investors. And in many cases, we're seeing projects that raise money through these new vehicles going on to then raise subsequent rounds from traditional investors. Um, and finally, you know, this is, I think, often overlooked in discussions around the culture of, of Web3 and sort of this idea of the libertarian crypto bro. But there are really new cultural priorities in Web3 that center access. So, um, you know, open source, as I mentioned, is really a, a cultural value in, in Web3. There's sort of this understanding that what is good for the ecosystem is also good for individual projects. And so we really see this in a mindset um, of, that's supportive of ecosystem change and community building and, and public goods. So um, we see grant programs that are focused on funding public goods. Um, we see a number of educational initiatives sort of focused on getting more diverse builders into the space um, and, and the like. Um, and so, you know, with all of that being said, you know, while there are a lot of the same challenges in Web3 and they are somewhat depressing, there are also these really novel and exciting opportunities that are afforded by the technology. And, you know, while it's still early days, particularly for some of these novel vehicles for organizing capital, could stand to be really transformative when we think about innovation ecosystems and who is able to build and, and for whom. There's this paradox here where, on one hand, there's higher operational costs. And then on the other hand, there's lower barriers to entry, right? I think I think the, the paradoxes here extend beyond, way beyond this. That's just on the builder side. As, as Susie was mentioning earlier about the, the deers in the headlight scenario, there's this other paradox at the at an at a foundation office, say, of of folks who just aren't tracking this conversation about Web three and its potential. Um, there's this this other paradox at a, at a at a more macro level where Web three is about disintermediation and a trust and trustless systems, and has very much been uh, carried by this banner of libert lots of libertarian ethos, techno, utopian types, right? And yet your work clearly is focused on these builders, these people, and trying to create interventions that increase the participation of these people. So help me unpack how we reconcile what is sometimes perceived as this as a libertarian, uh, techno-centric vision of Web3 with the messy reality of human society, its power structures, and our work in uh, policy making or funding or civil society in the case of TechSoup. There's a question for both. I know it's a big swing question, but it's just, uh, it's just sort of itching at me, this paradox. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Um, and, you know, I acknowledge I've, I've thrown around the term libertarian crypto bro a few times. Um, I think we can't acknowledge that there's a perception challenge, um, you know, associated with that image in the Web3 space. Um, but at the end of the day, technology is a tool and not an ideology. And and so I think that, um, at least from CCI's perspective, we're very interested in what people and communities can do with this technology, um, how they can use it, how they can stand to benefit from it. And that's really the the starting point for all of the research that we then do. Um, and so, uh, you know, as as this report highlights and, and some of our other research highlights, communities are really beginning to use this new technology, including some of, you know, its qualities that you just mentioned, disintermediation, trustless transactions, as infrastructure um, to better organize themselves and to organize resources at a more, you know, local or, or grassroots level. 
Um, and so to the extent that that technology can provide that kind of infrastructure, um, or as I mentioned, provide efficiencies that make new types of business models possible uh, that really begin to address some of the structural parameters of inequality or, or access, um, that is very important for those outside of Web3 to, to understand. Um, you know, of, of course, are there people who also want to use this technology to replace governments and other crazy things like that? Sure. Um, but I think that really sort of obfuscates the really important building that is happening in the space and the immense opportunity that is sort of afforded by this by this technology. Um, and I think to that end and um, thinking about the importance of education around some of these emerging use cases that are really critically important. Uh, along with this report, we've also launched a database of case studies really showcasing um, over 70 projects that are using Web3 technologies uh, to better organize resources to address real world challenges um, that are very focused on distributing benefits to communities that are focused on partnering with government entities and inserting themselves into existing structures. Um, and, and so I, I think that to the extent that we can shine a light and, and showcase some of these use cases, that, that's very important for, for all of our audiences. And I love that database. It's like, it's a way to really take a case study, take an example. And when I'm, when I'm in dialogue with someone where it's, I'm trying to explain um, how this is applicable to a particular issue area or sector, it's like, oh, take a look, you know, this is an example. And I think when people, I think there's a narrative change component here around um, getting through some of these broader paradox, mm -hmm. you know, issues that you, you named where I think it's really retelling or telling the story of opportunity versus I think there's this mainstream media narrative that has um, been constructed over the past decade or so that, you know, has painted crypto in a bad light, that is focused on the bad actors and is really, and I think it's just reframing that narrative um, and telling the stories, um, you know, the examples that are highlighted in this report, the case studies that are um, in the database around what is possible? Uh, I think at a macro level, you know, to the decentralized nature, the transparent, you know, everyone would love a transparent financial system, right? <laughs> and our current centralized financial system is anything but transparent, right? And, and we're all, you know, people who live in a privileged society who are highly banked, um, who are, can have access to all of these different platforms. And yet it is still not transparent. It is still, you know, there are many layers um, to disintermediate. And I think, um, again, to the extent we can simplify the story, we can um, reframe and, uh, and share a narrative that paints the picture of opportunity, uh, that's where we can kind of bring, bring folks along. And, you know, we haven't figured out, you know, what are, what are the, we're still developing, you know, a strategy and approach um, across you know, within our team first, um, but I think starting somewhere and, and, and anchoring um, with a few um, really great um, investments and examples and then building from there uh, and trying to contribute to a positive narrative um, and again, bring others along in the process. I think that's really where um, we're, we're trying to focus now because I think that we can get lost in a lot of this mess, <laughs> but, uh, but trying to again, simplify the narrative, highlight uh, these key um, examples that can explain the applicability of Web3 um, to um, these broader areas of, of work. Um, I think that's that's certainly a starting point or a place where we uh, find ourselves uh, focusing at the moment. It sounds very practical and it maps to some of our experience as well with uh, D-Web D uh, projects. We we built a use case library as one of the very, very early steps just to sort of have a reference point for conversations, whether it's an executive director at a nonprofit or a program officer. Uh, people want to see the actual examples of technology in action and the people behind the technology. And it's like that, that's the starting point. Right. And then the storytelling piece is also really, really critical. Um, we learned in a 
a project that was supported by the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web that th the makers in civil society struggle with um, expressing the impact that their tools and products are making in the world in terms that resonate with philanthropic investors so or impact investors. So, so literally the storytelling skill set was lacking. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's good to hear that you're acknowledging the need for narrative and, and storytelling skills. We're talking about this theme of influencing the others. Um, and I want to hear, uh, how, um, you Renee are thinking about how, you know, many of the folks in our audience are think of themselves as public interest technologists or public good techies. Uh, there's various acronyms and names to describe folks work, trying to use tech for good. Um, and my question is how you think they can um, influence policy to support a more equitable Web3. How can, can, how can this audience of very, very uh, ready, willing, and able uh, technologists working in civil society get into this conversation and influence policy? I, I think there's almost sort of like a virtuous uh, cycle, circle, um, uh, you know, between uh, between these groups, um, and and then uh, you know bodies that are doing research such as such as ourselves and the Kellogg Foundation. So um, we've been talking a lot about education and the elevation of solid use cases in this space, and I think that knowledge creation around those use cases is sort of it's the most important thing to to influence policy, right? So clear and inclusive regulation provides industry with the confidence to build, um, including technologies that, um, uh, you know, civil society uh, tech evangelists uh, can can then use um, to, to create positive impact. And, um, you know, and I think more critically, um, so, the experimentation that's needed, right, to really get at some of these solutions. So um, I think to get to that environment where um, builders feel safe, adopters of the technology feel safe, and policymakers feel safe, we really need collaboration. Um, innovation, policy, and uh, knowledge creation often occur in these si siloed parallels. And so I think initiatives such as yours that really connect decision makers um, in, in one space with those building um, and those providing the knowledge about some of these great use cases is, is really critical. Tell us about the future uh, research and initiatives at CCI RNA so that we can uh, stay on track and how are you specifically focused on promoting equity in the Web3 space as you move forward? Yeah, so we're very excited to be continuing our partnership with the with the WKK, WK Kellogg Foundation. Um, so we have forthcoming research um, in the pipeline that will build upon this first report um, to consider, um, I'm gonna start that over. Uh, we've got forthcoming research in the pipeline that's really going to be establishing a tactical framework for considering equity and inclusion across the Web3 ecosystem. So this first report really focused on the experiences of builders um, to sort of understand who's building in the space, what are the opportunities and challenges. The framework will really sort of expand the lens to consider other aspects of, of Web3. So who, what are the what are the levers of equity and inclusion across the ecosystem? Thinking about structural levers like policy and capital, uh, but also re relational levers, right? So how are people coming together? How are decisions being made? Um, you know, how are people finding the products and, and what is their experience of using them? And then really some considerations for mindset as well. We've been talking a lot about narrative creation and, and how that, you know, can really sort of shape um, what we're also preparing to launch research that will provide a more tactical look at a couple of um, specific sub-industries that are emerging within Web3 that we think are really important um, opportunity areas for increasing access um, to tools and services in, in often underserved communities. So um, specifically, we'll be taking a look at decentralized physical infrastructure networks. Um, so for those who are unaware, um, these are also referred to as DPIN uh, projects, and they uh, take a look 
Um, these are projects that use blockchain to manage actual physical infrastructure, such as connectivity networks and energy grids uh, in a decentralized manner, um, which is very exciting because there's an opportunity to sort of lower costs of deployment. Um, a big part of the digital divide is it's just very costly to deploy fiber um, to, to some rural areas. Um, and then we'll also be taking a look at approaches to addressing algorithmic bias um, using blockchain. So there's a lot of concern right now that um, the way that models work uh, can have unintended outcomes, both due to the data that may be input into models and, and inability to track how it gets used in some of the conclusions of the AI models. Um, and then also in terms of um, what's called drift associated with large language models. So over time, um, you know, these models may continue to teach themselves and reach conclusions that have sort of drifted. And at present, there's not really a way to examine uh, or verify, excuse me, how that's happened. So uh, we'll be sort of examining those issue areas and hopefully, um, you know, surfacing tactical use cases that civil society decision makers and investors can um, really use to contextualize their work. So I'm going to just ask a <laughs> last, uh, last question. It's about getting, um, getting involved with CCI's work. Um, how can people find the report, uh, send you questions, give you feedback, uh, and stay engaged with, with your research? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to throw up a slide for the last time with our contact information. Um, we, we really want to hear from you. Um, so you can find the research um, and the report at the Center for digitalfuture.org website. Um, this is a new uh, site that we have stood up to, to be a home for this important impact research. Um, you can also follow both of our organizations on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Um, we'd, we'd really just love to hear any feedback. Um, you know, we're also really always interested in um, identifying new participants in the research. If you're building in Web3 or are interested in investing or supporting uh, Web3 projects in any way, we would really love to hear from you. Um, I, I know Susie is, is always interested to hear from other investors in, in the space as well. Um, so please reach out, um, amplify the work, and check out the impact base. Well, I'm, I might just close on, you know, echoing that this is a huge opportunity um, for folks that are looking at equitable access to capital and, um, and again, closing uh, the digital divide and closing these racial, the racial and gender wealth gaps. Um, and I would invite everyone, if folks are going to SOCAP, um, so impact investors um, that are in our audience, we are actually going to be featuring um, some of the outcomes of this report and just these themes in general. We'll be doing a panel conversation uh, with CCI. So uh, CCI's CEO, Sheila Warren, will be on the panel. That's a conversation I'll be moderating. And then we will have other um, participants um, to, again, discuss the opportunities uh, that were highlighted in this report and some of the future research that uh, that Renee referenced. So I invite you to uh, find us at, uh, at SOCAP, which is uh, in October uh, here in San Francisco. We're hoping to engage more impact investors uh, in that conversation. Thank you both for uh, the information, um, spending time with us, and um, your, your good work in this really, really important area.